So the next thing we need to do is to install this stage file. So choosing a stage file on supported architectures, it is recommended for users targeting a desktop graphical operating system, which I am, to use a stage file with the term desktop within the name. These files include packages such as dev, devel LVM and dev lang rustbin and use flag tuning, which greatly improves install time. Now, being the, uh, uh, I don't know, control freak arguably that I am, I like to install the basic profile, um, basic stage file without the desktop so I can tune the system exactly how I want. Um, if you like, you can go ahead and use the desktop version, um, but I'll be going through and using the basic version and then just tuning the system myself. Um, which does obviously mean that um, extra time will be used building these packages. It it only saves time in the initial installation because subsequently when LLVM and Rust get updated, you're going to have to build them and compile them anyway. So it's it's only saving a bit of time at this particular stage. So the stage file acts as a seed of a Gen 2 installed stage files are generated with Catalyst by the released engineering team. So let's see what Catalyst is. It's a tool to build stage files and live images for Gen 2. So it's basically the tool that they use to create these seed environments. Stage files are specific based on specific profiles and contain an almost complete system. When choosing a stage file, it's important to pick one which, with a profile target corresponding to the desired system type. While it's possible to make major profile changes after installation has been established, switching requires substantial effort and consideration and is outside the scope of this installation manual. Switching in its systems is difficult, but switching from known multi-live to multi-live requires extensive Gen 2 and low-level toolchain knowledge. So I think this is one of the reasons why I don't choose a desktop is because I choose a no multi-live installation which means I install a pure 64-bit system. If you use multi-lib it means you'll be able to run 32-bit applications whereas an old multi-lib means you can only run pure 64-bit applications. Um, uh, then you've got a decision as to the type of init. Uh, as I say I'll be using the OpenRC. Um, it's just simpler. Uh, easy to understand. System D just seems to be, to me, unwieldy. Um, people argue about faster boot up times. I, I don't buy that because systems are so fast these days that you're probably just shaving a few seconds off of a boot. So it doesn't really make that much difference. So it's up to you how uh, what you want to install. Uh, but I'll be going through the OpenRC installation. So multi-lib, 32-bit and 64-bit, not every architecture has a multi-lib option. And as it says, the multi-lib uses 64-bit libraries where possible and only falls back to the 32-bit versions when strictly necessary. And using the multi-lib target makes it easier to switch profiles later compared to the no multi-lib. Uh, it says if you're just starting out on Gen 2, you should not choose a no multi-lib tarball unless it is absolutely necessary. Um, migrating from no multi-lib to multi-lib system requires extremely well work, well working knowledge of Gen 2 and the low level tool chain. It may even cause our tool chain developers to shudder a little. So it's not for the faint of heart it's beyond the scope of this guide. I've always installed Gen 2 with um, no multi-lib and never encountered any problems. The only problem I can possibly think of is if you wanted to run um something like steam which i believe is still only 32 bit that might be an issue um or you know you've got some other software that only runs 32 bit then definitely use multi-lib um, but otherwise like i say i've always run gen 2 right from day one which is probably 15 years ago now um and never had any issues at all with the software i run um selecting no multi-lib to be the base system provides a complete 64-bit operating system environment free of 32-bit software and effectively renders the ability to switch to multi-lib profiles burdensome but um, although it's technically possible 
So downloading the stage file, before downloading we need to change the location of the mount used for the install. So let's change into our MNT Gen 2 and if you remember this is the location where um, our file system will be. So you can see I've got the 468 gigabyte partition mounted on MNT Gen 2. Next thing to do is to check the date and time. Well, that is actually correct. It's actually 12 o'clock at the moment, but this is UTC time. Obviously the time zone's not been set uh, on this live CD. Um, so, it would only make sense that time if uh, it was winter time here because then it would be actually at GMT or UTC time. But as far as everything else is concerned, UTC time is, is 11 o'clock at the moment, so that is correct. Uh, it will get updated when we set the locale. Um, and it says here how to correct the time if it is off you can run that command or you can explicitly set the date using this command here um, it says here about graphical browsers use wget utilities to download the stage file or if you're on a command line browser it makes suggestions there So let's have a look. Yeah, this is the link I think we need to go to to get the stage. And what we want is a stage archive. So we've got, for me, what I want is no multi lib and I want OpenRC. So this is the download that I'll be fetching as you can see it's a smaller download because there's a lot less in there so what's missing in that is what I'll be compiling uh, as they suggested if you want the desktop profile they recommended that so for example um, OpenRC desktop profile it's 436 megabytes so it's a bigger download almost almost double but it does mean that initially you'll have less compiling to do when you're building the desktop up It also means when you boot into the Gen 2 environment, um, I imagine you'll you'll have a, a GUI, whereas with this no multi-lib OpenRC one, it will just be a basic um, command prompt interface. It'll be a bit a little bit more basic. So I'm going to take this option. I'm going to copy the link and do as it's suggested there. Download it using wget. So just type wget and center click to paste that. And while that's downloading, it looks like it's going to take a few minutes. Um, it suggests verifying the download with these checksums. So I'll fetch them as well. They're available. Uh, oh, down here. Stage three. So if I click on that, uh, which one I'm downloading? AMD no multi lib. So I'm going to go to parent stage three. No multi lib. Open RC. So that's what I'm downloading. So if I go into there, I'm currently downloading that file there. So I need to additionally download these files here. Okay, that's done. So I'm going to copy the link for the first one, 
paste that in, copy the link for the next one, paste that in, copy that one, and the final one, I think that should be everything. And then go back and it tells me how to check this. So to verify the SHA-512 checksum with an open SSL, I can run this command. So if I just press tab there, it will complete it. And I need to cross-reference that with the digest file. So So if I just scroll back, there's the output from the SHA-512, it starts 170A and the SHA-512 hash is 170A, ends in DA14F and when I ran the command ends in DA14F. I can also run the same command using a different digest or different checksum. So let's do that. So this is the Blake 512, which is uh, not actually there, funnily enough. Let's try the Blake 2B. That looks like there's two there. Blake 2B. Oh, that's content. So yeah, it should be this number here. Let's try that without the 512. No, it doesn't work. Oh no, that that is it. Sorry, yeah, that is it. The five one two is the correct one. So that number ends in six nine five four F six nine five four F and starts one four five B six and begins one four five B six. So that's that's correct. And we can use the SHA-256 sum utility if we want. I'm not sure why the show has all these methods. I guess it's kind of educational. We do get a warning saying um, 12 lines are improperly formatted. This is probably better because it's actually cross-checking against the um, checksum file. And it actually tells us that it's it's correct without us having to cross cross check ourselves. For official Gen 2 live images, the SEC keys open GP open PGP keys Gen 2 release package provides PGP sign in for automated releases. The keys must be imported in the user session or to be used for ver verification. So we can do this. And then for all non-official live images which offer a bundle containing Gen 2 keys can be fetched and imported. Verify the signature of the tarball and optionally associated checksum file. So let's do that. So this is the ask file. And it says the verification succeeds, good signature from will appear. And there it is there. Let's check the digest file. And again, it says good signature from. And finally, let's check the SHA-256. Uh, again, good signature. So that's all I good. It proves that everything ties up and there's nothing been tampered with. So let's just review what we've done there. We've downloaded the stage three file. We've downloaded some check files as well to validate that. And we're now going to extract this file. Uh, I think this content is just a text file with the contents of this archive. 
and they've got a specific tar command here to extract it and it explains what the extra uh, options are so it's important to use that command and not decide to use your own So to optimize the system, it is possible to set variables which impact the behavior of Portage, Gen 2's official, officially supported packet manager. All those variables can be set as environmentals using export, but set via setting via export is not permanent. Technically, variables can be exported via shells, profiles, or RC files. However, that is not best practice for basic system administration. Portage reads the make.com file when it runs, which will change runtime behavior depending on the values saved in the make dot conf in filemake.conf which can be considered the primary configuration file for portage so treat its content carefully a commented listing of all possible variables can be found in that location uh, an example so that could be quite useful um, it also mentions that uh, Documentation of the make.conf can be found by running man5make.conf. So that's a useful thing to know. For a successful Gen 2 installation only, the variables that are mentioned below need to be set. So while there are loads of other options in the make.conf, uh, as it says there, only the specific ones mentioned uh, the ones that are needed to ensure a successful installation. From the make.conf example file, it's obvious how the file syntax should be. Oh, yeah, let's edit it actually. Okay, so that's the default make.conf, which is when you know what a fully fledged make.conf looks like you can see that it looks quite basic at the moment but we will be adding stuff to it um, yeah from the make conf example file it's obvious how the file should be structured so let's have a quick look at that the example uh, make conf example where was it user share portage config make dot conf example so yeah you can see there's a lot more stuff in there that could be added but let's start with the basic one and add things as we go through So the first thing we've got is C flags and CXX flags. So we can do some optimization. Um, although these are generally defined here for maximum performance, one would need to optimize these flags for each program separately. The reason for this is because every program is different. However, this is not manageable, hence the definition of these flags in the make.conf file. Um, one should define the optimization flags that will make the system most responsive generally. Don't replace experimental settings, make too much optimization because it can make them crash or even malfunction. A first setting is the March or M tune flag. Um, now there are, yeah, there's two links here which are really useful if you want to set these. I do set them. Uh, just minimally based on information here. It explains some more information here about what they are. Uh, as you can see by default we get optimization level 2 and pipe to use memory for piped commands rather than files. Um, and there is a page here with some uh, recipes for common architectures it uh, looks like there's a, a tool here for auto detection now which is quite a good idea so let's come out of that and see if we can run that
Okay, so it does need to be installed. Or we can look at CPU info to get some information. Uh, let's see if we can add that file. This may fail because we're in the live environment. Yeah, it, it's not going to work. So we can't, it's not actually available in the live environment, which is a bit unfortunate. Um, so maybe we can install that afterwards and confirm that the settings we're about to set are the correct ones. So we've got Alder Lake for 12th Gen, which will be the same for 13th and 14th. Uh, Sky Lake, KB Lake, KB Lake, R, Coffee Lake, Comet, Comet Lake. So I've got 6, 1, 6, 7, 11th Gen. So it's probably going to be this Sky Lake, I imagine. Especially as we're going back in time. Yeah, now we're on to AMD and other architectures. So yeah, there's a command here to get GCC to tell us what it thinks it will be. So it recommends Rocket Lake for MTune. Yeah, and March is Rocket Lake as well. So that's what I'll be setting in my C flags. So if I recall that make.conf, I'll add in March equals Rocket Lake and Mtune equals Rocket Lake. And generally, that's all I set for um, the uh, C flags and CSX flags. As you can see, these common flags are then put into C flags, CXX flags, FC flags, and F flags. Um, one other I also add in, even though it's there by default for O2, I believe in certain circumstances, if O2 gets turned off, um, this still can help is minus F omit frame pointer, which can help in certain situations as I, as I say, circumstances. Also possible suboptimal March native detection, full L2 cache size to single CPU thread on multi-core CPUs. Currently used only for prefashion was sometimes good choice to fall back to default or own calculated value to reduce cache concurrency on high SMP load, but this is in theory not for all tasks. Do nothing if unsure. So let's save that. Control X, yes, and press enter. Let's just, oh, it's there. So I've got level two cache size equals one six three eight four. So I'll try that. I've, this is new to me. I have seen it before, but it's new to me. They're actually stating that it can help. Not that it definitely will do, but it can help. So that might be worth trying. Also possible suboptimal. 
March equals native detection full L2 level cache size to single CPU thread. Ah, so is it saying to reduce it to 512 maybe? Yeah, not sure about that. I might just uh, leave it at the moment. It says do nothing if unsure. So I think I'll have to research that a bit more to understand what implications there are for setting that. Uh, so if I go back to GCC optimization, um, this does give some information how to find out what the machine is capable of. There's also this CPU ID to CPU flags, which, oh yes, I don't think that used to be there, but it is now. It gives all the extra flags that are available. And they can be added to the make.conf. So what I tend to do after running that is to copy this. and add it to the make.conf uh, generally tend to stick it down here paste it in there and all we need to do is put that into a string and change this to an equals like that so it's basically assigning that string with the spaces to CPU flags x86 and it is x86 for 64 bit or 32 bit, it's the same uh, variable name. So let's save that, and they've got a couple of other commands here to find out what the tuning and march should be so we can run them just to confirm what we've seen um, so that tells us what the known arguments are and this what this does it shows us uh, what options are enabled or disabled by default for this particular architecture So you can see certain AVX commands are disabled and others are enabled, for example, AVX and AVX2 is enabled, uh, obviously M machine size 16 bit and 32 bit is obviously disabled but machine size 64 bit is enabled so that, that all looks good. So that could be useful. Uh, things also like these flags were just identified with the CPU ID to CPU flags. You can see that's enabled and that's one of the ones we just added in. This other one I think helps more specifically with March and M-Tune. Uh, yes, there's the March again it's been set to or identified as Rocket Lake. So that is what GC, so GCC would tend to use by default. Um, and also M-Tune is down there. And again, the level two cache size is sex, set 16K. Um, as I say, that's something I'll be investigating to find out whether that is worth adding in or not. The L2 cache size option represents processors last level cache L2 or higher if present. The glib hardware caps features can be used to define March for a more general processor architecture. Uh, 
Okay, so this is the architecture that I was speaking about at the beginning. It shows that this processor supports all the, or obviously it supports the original x86-64 because that's what everybody's been using up until recently where these uh, different levels have been defined. Um, and as you can see, it supports all levels. It's strange because V4 is the one that supports AVI, uh, AVX512 and that's been turned off in newer um, i5, i7, i9, probably i7, i9 processors. However, it's still used in the Xeon processors, so that, that would be turned on for all the latest Xeon processors, but obviously not in the latest. But being this is a Generation 11, it has still got that functionality, so it's kind of a bit strange that uh, old technology for bog standard desktop processors supports something uh, that's the latest functionality or latest um, technology. However, the latest versions of the processors don't. So again, there's some more settings there or more examples. And there's some more information there about configuring um, different options. Yeah, how some of these may indeed make the um, compilation slower or execution slower. Yeah, this is the one I've set here. This is a very common flag designed to reduce generated code size. It's turned on at all levels of O except for O0 on architectures where doing so does not interfere with debugging but it may need to be activated in that case to add it to the flags. Although, though the GCC manual does not specify all architectures, it is turned on by using the O option. It's still necessary to explicitly enable from it frame point, pointer option to activate it on x8632. Um, it makes debugging harder and possible. Well, I don't debug, so that doesn't matter. It's also worth noting that keeping frame pointers is actually beneficial when profiling code base and users may want to disable this through no omit frame pointer rather than omit frame pointer. And it says there uh, not to mix it with a similar flag. And there's other there, others there about um, setting extra flags and hardening. PGO, I've generally found it works. Some packages don't work with it, so you have to turn it off. Uh, yeah, like Firefox gets mentioned there, sometimes it works, some version, other times it breaks, so we may indeed find that. LTO, again, I've turned it on. Sometimes it seems to cause problems and other times it doesn't. Um, so there is an actual LTO uh, page now about this. <clears throat> so that may be something to add in. Uh, let's see what it says here can give double digit performance boost for many programs so that could be quite good can lower RAM usage per program but the compiling takes two to three times uses more RAM during compiling and not all programs become faster or smaller there's an increased chance of finding build time or runtime bugs and always prepare to try without it if something's acting odd and that's exactly what I found sometimes weird things happen and just by turning LTO off or as I say PGO profile guided optimization things automatically start working so um, I guess I could try it with this this is a capable machine so I guess we could add it in these warnings indicate likely runtime problems with LTO so promote them to errors if a package fails to build with these LTO should not be used there Okay, so that sounds like that might be a good thing to 
use So let's copy this in. And then add in this FLTO warning errors, uh, warning flags. And we'll find out how we get on with that when we start compiling. <coughs> with GCC, you can also pass a number of processes to use for linking to the FLTO parameter using FLTO number of processes, which will speed it up. Usually, yeah, it does usually use all the processes. And to add it to the use flag, so there is no use flag by default, although there are use flag settings used by default. So this is the other part that makes Gen 2 really powerful is the ability to switch on and turn off certain features either globally or individually. So I've just turned on LTO for any packages that recognize that flag. And let's just confirm there. LTO fixes have mostly trickled down from testing to stable, but there are, or there could still be exceptions. It mentions Emacs there as a, an example. It mentions there about disabling LTO. So let's copy that and we can set that up if we need to in the future. So it looks like we just add in that disable LTO as and when we need it. In fact, I'm going to put a link to this web page here. for reference. There's also something here for link time optimization for GCC, which looks like we've configured that. Okay, so we've done some optimization to GCC for tuning to the processor and also optimizing the actual compilation using LTO. <clears throat> so make opts, this always confused me because this is where you add the number of threads that can be used for a make, but generally make uses something called make flags. So I have to try and adjust my head to make sure I'm using the right one, depending whether I'm using Gen 2 or Linux from scratch. <clears throat> so if left undefined portages or portages default behaviors to be to set make ops jobs value to the same number of threads returned by nprox so nprox a tool that tells you how many 
processes are available basically. You can see it returns 16. And further, as of a later version, if left undefined, Portage's default behavior is to set the make ops load average value to the same number of threads returned by NPROC. A good choice is the smaller of the number of threads the CPU has or the total amount of system RAM divided by 2. So system RAM divided by 2 got 128 gig, that would be 64, but I've only got 16 threads. So basically the number of threads the CPU has, 16, is the recommendation for this machine. And it says a large number of thread, uh, jobs can significantly impact memory consumption. A good recommendation is to have at least two gig around for every job specified. This is what the um, rule of thumb that I go by at the moment. Uh, very rarely are there anything that I can think of that uses more than two gig RAM per job. Um, no doubt that will change in time, um, but it's it's a good guesstimate. And if it does go over that, then you've got a little bit of swap and you'll see that happen. So it may be an indication then to reduce the number of parallel jobs by one. So this is the number of jobs that a compile can run out. We can also tell Portage to run multiple jobs at the same time, but obviously, as it says, it can grow exponentially. So if it decides to run two jobs at the same time, that's two times the number of in threads. So in this case, that'll be 12 threads running at the same time. So that needs to be borne in mind. Um, it doesn't mention here what L is. <clears throat> I think that's the load value. So it won't go above that load value. Um, but it does say you can see manmake.com for more details. Let's have a quick nose at that. So there's lots of information here. Let's look for make opts. No, it's not been found. There it is there. Okay, it wasn't underscore. Yeah, in order to avoid excess load, the load average option is recommended. Yeah, I think that's what that L, that L5 is. I tend not to use that because I tend not to... Um, install more than one job at a time and generally if you do allow I, I tend to install with two jobs at a time but generally um, if you do allow two jobs to run at, at the same time that's normally enough uh, so let's edit this and add in make opts I'm going to actually add in make ops here I'll copy this all in so there's a comment here about it to remind me and I'll leave that commented out to remind me that I can set the load level there and just set make ops equals minus j16 okay so one other thing I'm going to do I'll save that is to do emerge minus minus info to find out what the current use is use flags are and these are the ones that are set by default and there it is that's what I want to know so I just want to keep a record of what the defaults are Just for my information. Uh, 
Right, sorry, that's the live environments. That's a load of rubbish, that is. I'll need to do that when we're in the true environment. So I'll just put some question marks there for now to remind me in case I forget. <laughs> 